So uh, welcome to uh, everyone who uh, has joined us today. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Um, my name is Amy Jewett, and uh, I am the Invasive Species Coordinator uh, here at the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And today's webinar is going to be uh, talking about mapping uh, invasive species in your uh, local natural area. Um, just as a quick heads up to everybody, um, I am going to be uh, going through the entire webinar um, and then at the end, if anyone has questions, uh, we can, uh, I can take your questions at that time. So, um, uh, so throughout the webinar, just hold your questions and then we'll have some time at the end to go over that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so what is a natural area? Um, natural areas come in all shapes and sizes, and they are developed through uh, natural growth rather than by design or planning, and they can be publicly or privately owned. Uh, all natural areas generally support a wide variety of plant and animal species and provide ecosystem services, including things like carbon sequestration, stormwater management, clean air and water, food and fiber, and habitat for wildlife, just to name a few of the benefits that they provide. So uh, natural areas can look very differently, and I did just want to go through quickly some examples of uh, what you can uh, think of as the natural area. And so the photo here on this screen is showing uh, someone's backyard. So even just a wild space in your backyard can be considered a natural area. Also, if you have uh, a place near you that has a community park, um, those are also um, can be considered uh, natural areas as well. Uh, a state park, uh, we do have a lot of state parks in Pennsylvania, and so again, these are really great um, and special natural areas. Uh, national parks, of course, uh, usually a bit on the larger side. Uh, we do have one that's fairly close to us in Ohio, Cayuga, Valley National Park. Uh, also, uh, we have a lot of state forests in Pennsylvania as well, and these are uh, really beautiful and magnificent natural areas as well to explore. Uh, we have a lot of state game lands. Um, if so, if you're a hunter and you enjoy going out and uh, doing that as um, uh, for fun, we do have a lot of uh, state game lands as well that are uh, really special natural areas. Uh, water bodies, uh, including streams, creeks, lakes, uh, or ponds, are all uh, considered natural spaces as well, just in the aquatic realm. Uh, or even a protected preserve. So we do have a lot of uh, local uh, land trusts uh, scattered across Pennsylvania that are protecting uh, these natural spaces, and they can be uh, small in size, ranging from uh, an acre or less, uh, upwards of you know many many acres and again these are also very uh, important and special natural areas uh, so these areas of course they're very important and so this webinar is going to be talking about uh, one specific thing that each of us can do to help to support these places um, so again as we mentioned uh, these places provide uh, value to not only people, but also to wildlife and the environment as a whole. Uh, so it's really important for us to care for these places and to protect and maintain them to be as pristine uh, and wild as possible. So what is it that each of us can do to uh, help to maintain these areas? Uh, well, the thing that we're going to be talking about today is um, going out and searching for and documenting any invasive species that we find uh, using the IMAP Invasives mobile app. And so data that is reported using uh, the mobile app to IMAP Invasives can then be utilized for future management efforts uh, by natural resource professionals and uh, concerned citizen scientists. So the first part of the webinar is going to be going through a series of screenshots uh, that will be, uh, I'll be showing you uh, to give a, a better idea of how to utilize the mobile app uh, so that when you go out in the field and start using it, you kind of know what to expect. Uh, so using the mobile app um, is an easy way uh, to report invasive species data while you're outdoors and you're away from your computer. Uh, in the past, the only way that we um, 
had to um, uh, that we had to document this information was to have a pencil and paper. And now uh, we have the ability to um, to use these different apps. Uh, so when you are using an internet uh, or when you're using the mobile app, you do not need an internet connection. Um, and so that makes it a lot easier. And uh, when you're ready to, uh, you can upload any observations that you make uh, using um, uh, Wi-Fi when you have that available. Okay. Uh, so the app is designed for use on um, Android and Apple devices. Uh, and you can use it on either a uh, smartphone or a tablet. And you just have to keep in mind that your device does need to have an integrated GPS uh, inside of it. There are some devices that actually don't have this, uh, but and so just keep that in mind, that is a requirement. Okay, so let's go through step by step and uh, take a look at uh, how to use the mobile app. Uh, so uh, the first thing you wanna do is to actually go in and download. Um, the app from wherever you get your apps from. And just uh, for your information, the screenshots that you'll see uh, here on today's webinar are taken from an Android smartphone. Um, so if you have an iPhone, it might look a little bit differently, uh, but you'll, you'll basically understand how to do it. Uh, so on an Android device, you would visit the Play Store um, and then search using the keyword IMAP Invasives and then you should see something show up uh, there on the right hand side, that screenshot there. Uh, that shows uh, the IMAP Invasives mobile, uh, and then you just would follow the prompts to go ahead and install the app. So once you have the app installed, the first thing you want to do before you actually go ahead and start adding data is to set your preferences. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll tap the menu icon that's located in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and choose your jurisdiction. So for most of you guys, that's going to be Pennsylvania. Uh, just for anyone on the phone, if you could uh, just mute uh, your, your computer for now, that way we can uh, make sure everyone can hear okay. Appreciate that. Um, so once you um, are in your preferences, one of the first things you're going to do after setting your jurisdiction is to fill in your email address and your IMAP Invasives password. Um, and your email address, now that we have shifted over to a new IMAP platform, your email address is actually your username, and your password will be a new password um, that you will reset once you log in to um, the, the new version that we now have. Um, so if you're unsure what email address is associated with your IMAP account, you can always reach out to me um, and just double check that if you do have any problems. Uh, if you don't already have an IMAP Invasives account or if you forget your password, uh, you can just click on the, the button there that says create account or reset password. Okay, so uh, once you've gone, uh, once you've done that, uh, the next part, there's a button there in your preferences that says click the retrieve IMAP list. Uh, and you'll need to do that uh, in order to um, have the most up to date information available on the mobile app. And so by doing that, you'll be able to uh, have access to the most updated uh, track species list. Uh, our projects, and also um, affiliated organizations within IMAP Invasives. Uh, continuing on with your preferences, uh, it gives you the option to um, choose how you want to see the species list. So you can choose to look at just common names, you can choose just scientific names, or you can choose to view both at the same time. And so those screenshots will, will show you that. Um, again, continuing on with your preferences, you can create a custom species list, which is an optional tool. You don't have to do this, but it is available. And essentially creating a custom species list will save you some time when you're out in the field and you're trying to find the species that you have observed within the, the full track list. So essentially it takes the, the list down from about two or three hundred species to you know maybe five or ten depending on what you choose um, and so again when you would when you would choose that only the species that you would select in that custom list 
would appear when you're adding an observation. Um, so again, that's something that you can utilize if you choose to, and if not, then that's fine too. It just is an option that might help to speed up the um, data entry process a little bit. So here in these screenshots, uh, just to give you an example, I've made a custom list of five species that include hemlock woolly adelgid, Japanese knotweed, Norway maple, oriental bittersweet, and privet. So again, if I'm only out searching um, for those species, and that's all I want to record, then creating a custom list would probably be beneficial in that regard. Okay, um, so continuing on, uh, you'll want to choose your picture quality for any observation photos that you take with the app. I believe the default is set to 50%, which is fine, uh, but you can modify that if you choose. And there is also a checkbox that you can choose if you want to save the observation photos that you take with the app to your device's photo library. So again, if that's something that you'd like to do, uh, you can do that. Also, it'll, it allows you to choose which base map you'd like to see when entering your observation points. So you can choose from either a road view or a satellite view. And also, uh, if you're part of a project, uh, it will allow you to select the project that you want to capture uh, data under. Again, that is an optional tool. You do not have to track data under a particular project. Um, and again, just for those who might not be familiar, projects and IMAP invasives are um, something that allows you to group data together um, for easy querying in the IMAP invasives platform at a later time. So for example, if you are um, working for a particular organization and you are um, tracking species in various uh, sites within a property, you might want to create uh, various projects that would be, um, for, that would pertain to each of those particular sites. Um, and that way you can then query for the data that was found in each of those sites uh, fairly easily. So again, that's just an example. We have a lot of different projects set up um, in IMAP invasives already, and so that is certainly an option if you'd like to take advantage of that. Um, but if you do want to select a default project in the app, you do already have to be a member of that project to make a selection here in the app. Uh, so you can uh, request to become a member of a project by logging onto the desktop version of IMAP invasives, or you can create a new project, again, by logging onto uh, the desktop version choosing projects from the main menu, and then saying, I'd like to create a new project. Also, uh, make sure you select your default organization, which this is probably something that you already did when you were, um, again, when we're setting up these preferences. Um, and uh, you're, when you're logged into the desktop version of IMAP Invasives, that's where you would select um, which organization you're affiliated with, and then that would kind of transfer over to uh, the app where you would select it from there as well. Uh, so if no selections appear in the default organization field and you are a part of an organization that you would like to have appear there, simply just log in to the um, desktop version of IMAP Invasives and request to become uh, a member of whatever organization you um, are interested in or that you are affiliated with. And if you don't want to be uh, associated with a specific organization, you can just leave this field blank uh, in the app. And then once you're finished doing all of that, you want to make sure that you hit save at the very bottom. And that's going to save all of those preferences that you just chose. Again, and that's going to be specific to you um, as uh, the person that is, um, you know, logging in and using the app here. Uh, so you want to make sure that you save any changes that you make. Okay, so once you're ready um, and you, you're done fill, filling in your preferences, uh, you can go ahead and actually start utilizing the app. So you would open it up on your phone or your tablet, um, and there is just a few brief instructions there on the home page uh, that show you uh, a little bit about where various um, um, tasks are on the app, and so that you can quickly review that. And then once you're ready, there is that button up in the right-hand corner that says Add Observation, and that's what you're going to click when you're ready to start uh, logging your invasive species findings. And for this particular example that I'm going to show you guys, uh, we'll be creating an observation record for Japanese knotweed. 
So the first thing you're going to do is uh, you're going to take a photo using your phone um, or using your, your device's camera, I'm sorry. Uh, or you can select to uh, use an existing photo in your device's library. Right, so you can do either way. But whatever you choose, just make sure that the photo you, you take or you select includes distinguishing characteristics of the species that you found. And this is really important because in order for your uh, record to then be confirmed in IMAP and bases, um, we need to be able to confirm the identity of that species from your photograph. And so if it doesn't have the distinguishing characteristics that we need to identify it, or if it's like kind of far away or fuzzy, um, then that record we might not be able to confirm. So again, make sure that you're taking uh, really good distinguishing um, photos of the species that you're finding. Also keep in mind, currently the way the app is set up, you can only um, take and save one photo per observation that you make. Um, this is hopefully going to change in the future so that you can take multiple photos um, using the app for per observation, but for now it's only one. But keep in mind, you can take additional photos, save them to your phone, and then when you are back in the office or your, your home computer, you can add them to your observation record by logging onto the IMAP Invasives platform on your desktop computer. Um, so that is an option, so keep that in mind. Okay, so once you've added your photo, the next thing you're going to do is select the species that you observe. Uh, and so again, if you chose a custom species list in your preferences, you can, choose, you can check that box next to custom list, and only the species that you chose to be there in that custom list will appear. Uh, and if you don't check it, then the entire track species list uh, will appear, which is a much longer list. So again, whatever you decide to do is, is fine and both options are available. Um, also, you can select to choose if you detected the species or you search for a species and you didn't find it. So in other words, um, you can uh, record both presence and absence information um, on the app. And also um, for the date, the date will automatically be filled in for whatever the current day is that you're utilizing the app on. So if that needed to be changed, if you were entering data from like a week ago or something like that, then you can modify that date if you need to. Um, the next thing is going to be the location of where you made your observation at. Uh, so the GPS uh, that's in your device will automatically determine your location. So that makes it really easy for you. Um, but if you notice that for whatever reason, the um, location for your observation doesn't appear to be quite at the right location, uh, you can uncheck that GPS box and uh, manually move the point to another location uh, on the map. So that is an option as well. But generally, um, most GPSs will get you pretty close to where you are, so you shouldn't have to do that. Uh, keep in mind, if you do not have um, coverage in an area where you're making an observation, the base map is not going to display. So you can see that there in one of the screenshots where the map, uh, it's just blank. All you can see is that little yellow pointer. Um, but just keep in mind that even though it doesn't appear that, it, that your GPS is working because the map doesn't appear, it is, your GPS is still working um, and you can still um, create an observation record. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, it's just it, just how it shows up on the app. Okay, continuing on. So we mentioned briefly before about projects when setting up uh, your preferences. So again, projects are an optional tool that will allow uh, data to be grouped together for easy querying at a later date. So if you would like to tag a particular observation under a certain project, then you can do that. But again, if you don't want to do that, then that's fine. You would just leave that particular field blank. Also, you would select your affiliated organization if you didn't already fill that in in your preferences. And then also, uh, if you'd like, you can enter in the time uh, in minutes that you search the area where you made your observation. So that's also something you can fill in. 
And then depending on what species you select that you observe, uh, there will be a few additional questions that will pop up on the app. So for example, if you found a particular invasive plant species, uh, a question will come up asking for the distribution of that plant. So for example, we can see in the uh, screenshots here on the lower left, um, you have either a single plant or a clump that would be considered a trace amount. Uh, you had scattered plants or clumps, so that would be more of a sparse distribution. Uh, you found uh, dense plants, clumps, there is a whole monoculture, or the plants were uh, along a road or a trail, so they were literally scattered. So you can choose uh, from one of those options, which will help to give a better indication of the distribution of that species that you found. Uh, another example is if you found a invasive insect. So for example, if you found hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, a question will appear asking how many plants were noticeably affected by the insect. And so again, you could fill that in um, as you are noting it to be in the field. There is a section at the very bottom that allows you to add additional comments. So I would encourage you to make use of that. Um, again, it just helps to make your uh, record more informative to others who are looking at it. And so comments can include information um, on population density, uh, nearby landmarks, uh, or additional observers. The list can go on and on. So really, whatever you think is um, helpful or appropriate to add in there, then please uh, make sure to utilize that. So for this example, with finding Japanese knotweed, I said in the comments several plants were found in a riparian zone and the affected area seems to show signs of erosion, again, because of the presence of Japanese knotweed. So that's just an example of a comment that you could leave um, when making an observation. So when you're finished filling in all of these data fields, you wanna make sure that you're gonna save that observation. And then once you save it, your newly created record is then gonna appear in a list on the home page of the mobile app. And you can see that there uh, on the right hand side in that particular screenshot. And then uh, you would just kind of keep on going through that process of creating observation records. And then your list will keep getting bigger and bigger. So right now we only have uh, one record that is showing in that screenshot, but you can keep adding and, and have a, a whole bunch that are in there. And then once you're you're ready to load that into the database, because right now it's just living on your app. Uh, you'll have to get back to an area where you have a data connection um, to, or the internet uh, to do so. And so once you are in that area where you have access to the internet, you have access to Wi-Fi, what you'll do is click on the checkbox that's next to each observation record. And then you're going to access the main menu and check uh, or select the option where it says upload selected. And once you choose that, a window is going to appear that asks you to confirm that you would indeed like to upload the selected records to IMAP. And so you would just say OK to that. And then once you do that, you should notice that your record um, has actually disappeared from the main screen of the app. And that's a good thing, because that means that it's no longer living on the mobile app, and it's now been successfully uploaded into the IMAP Invasives database. So if you do continue to see that queue of records uh, linger on your, on your phone or, or your device after you try to upload it, that means that something didn't go quite right, uh, and it didn't upload successfully. So you'll want to just go through that process of uploading again, and hopefully you will notice that those records will disappear uh, from, from your queue there. Okay, so then what happens once your report has been submitted to the IMAP Invasives database? Uh, it will again no longer be on your mobile app, which is what we want. We want it to be within the platform itself. And your record will uh, now be listed as, as unconfirmed. And that simply means that it's a new, newly created record and uh, it hasn't been reviewed yet, either by the uh, IMAP Invasives Administrator or by another expert who might, be, uh, who might have uh, verifying privileges. So for most part, it's going to be uh, the administrator that will review your record. And so uh, it will be looked at, and if the ID is determined to be correct based on the photograph that you include, 
uh, then your record will be confirmed. But if there are any questions uh, that come up from your record uh, regarding the identification or maybe the location doesn't seem quite right, maybe it's a um, aquatic species that was mapped on land or vice versa, uh, then the administrator would, would reach out to you with, with those questions just to determine um, you know, if it needs to be remapped or if the species is incorrect or something like that. Okay, so I did mention before, but I just want to again reiterate, um, taking good photos uh, when you're using the app and capturing invasive species data is a really, really crucial component um, of data collection. And so I want to show you just a few examples of some pictures that are not so great uh, and to try to avoid taking these types of pictures when you're out in the field. So if you look at the two photos there on the left-hand side, uh, the, both of these photos are, are too far away, um, and because of that, we would not be able to make an identification uh, and confirm your record if these were the, the photos that were included with your record. You would have to get um, a lot closer to that species in order for it to be uh, identified. Now, certainly we can kind of make some guesses as to what this probably is, but again, making a final determination to say, yes, this is definitely, you know, narrowleaf cattail, or yes, this is definitely Japanese knotweed, or I'm sorry, Japanese maple, um, you know, we would need some photos that would be a lot closer up. Uh, here, this picture here on the right-hand side, uh, this is close, um, uh, but it's still inadequate for identification. You would need some additional photos that would show more of the plant's distinguishing characteristics, such as flowers, um, or maybe something else that would be uh, unique to that species uh, that would help us to really know for sure what the uh, identification is there. Uh, this photo, I think, as most of you can see, is very fuzzy. Um, and so even though this wasn't necessarily a photo depicting the identification of a particular species, um, it's showing an area where the observer was, where he was finding um, specifically New Zealand mud snails. Again, so even though this is helpful, it's very hard to see. Uh, again, it would be nice if it wasn't quite so fuzzy. So try to uh, be as still as possible when you're taking photos to avoid having pictures like this. And then looking at the picture here on the left-hand side, again, this one is taken uh, a bit too far away. So looking at this, it kind of looks like this might be butterfly bush, but again, I really can't tell for sure. So you would have to get up a lot closer and take some good distinguishing uh, photos of that, of that species to, um, to have that record be confirmed in the database. And then here on the right-hand side, uh, this one's a little tricky, but this is actually a cultivated species, Japanese maple, uh, considered to be invasive in natural areas, but it's not one that we want to report to IMAP invasives if you're finding it in a place where it was probably planted there on purpose. And as we know, Japanese maples are uh, very popular uh, and a lot of people have them in their yards and gardens. And so this is not one that we want to report. So cultivated species are ones that we want to stay away from where they're in areas um, that they were purposely planted. And so I just want to go into that a little bit more, uh, cultivated species and not reporting them to IMAP and the reasons why. Uh, so again, these are species that have been purposely planted in the locations where they're found um, in yards, gardens, and landscaped areas. And so even though some of these species um, are actually in, truly invasive, um, they are not really ever going to be treated or cut down uh, or essentially removed by natural resource professionals. And so uh, even though they can, their presence can lead to uh, escapees that can then uh, end up in our natural spaces. The purpose of tracking uh, this observation data in IMAP invasives is ultimately to manage and control the species that are found. So again, we're probably not going to go into a Walmart parking lot and start cutting down all of their calorie pear trees if that was the case. If we did, we would get in a lot of trouble. So um, these are just a few examples, a few pictures to show you. Uh, in the, the tops, the picture here, don't report calorie pairs that you find along a roadside. But go ahead, 
support the calorie repairs that you're finding in a natural setting. So here's just a few other examples of that. So this is Japanese spirea. Again, it's something that a lot of people, um, unfortunately, do like to utilize in their home gardens. So we would not want to report um, spirea that's being found in a location like this, but we would want to uh, report it if it's being found in, a, in a, um, a forest or a natural space, such as the picture that we can see here. Uh, another example is a species called hardy kiwi vine. This is also another popular um, garden plant that a lot of people will utilize in their, um, uh, at their private residences. So we don't want to report hardy kiwi vine when it's being found in a place like this. But if we see it um, to uh, the level, especially in this photo, but if we see it in a, a natural space, again, this is something we definitely do want to report. So I want to delve a little bit more into some of the species that you might be finding uh, when you're out in your local natural areas. And so these, again, are going to be just a handful of probably many of the species that are out there. Uh, and we'll go through and kind of give you a, a little bit more uh, information about some of these species that you might be finding. OK, so here are some pictures of our first species. This is Japanese knotweed. And Japanese knotweed is known to invade um, not only terrestrial uh, and upland habitats, but also these uh, riparian corridors, so places where there's a water body or a river or a stream. And during storm events, Japanese knotweed will very often um, amplify any erosion issues uh, that are already present in that area. And so it, it will, a lot of times, rather than stream bank, it will shear it off because the roots um, do not hold the soil. Uh, it can also, in places I think many of us are probably familiar with, um, it can form these really dense monocultures and essentially nothing else can grow there. So it's really a detriment to our native plant species that also like to live uh, in these same habitats but are unable to compete with the Japanese knotweed. And again, uh, Japanese knotweed is, is pretty common throughout the state. Uh, and so I wanted to mention that even though uh, it is as common as, as, it, as we know it to be, uh, still going out and mapping where you are finding it, whether it's just one stem or it's a large infestation, is still really important to do because gathering this data uh, will increase the known distribution uh, for Japanese knotweed in Pennsylvania. So again, don't don't let the fact that you have a species that's really common uh, deter you from, um, from marking it uh, or mapping it. Okay, our next species is bush honeysuckle. And bush honeysuckle, uh, again, is known to compete with our native plant species um, for sunlight, moisture, um, and also our pollinators. It can uh, distract our pollinators from going to the native plants and it can draw them away to, uh, to something like this invasive species. Um, also, birds are known to eat the fruits that come from honeysuckle, but the, the invasive um, forms of honeysuckle are poorer in fats and nutrients than fruits that they would uh, be able to consume from our native plants. And so when they eat these fruits from the invasive honeysuckle, they're not actually getting enough nutrients to help sustain them during the long flights that they take during migration. So you could essentially think of it as, um, you know, us eating a whole lot of junk food, Doritos and, and Sun Chips or something like that, rather than eating um, healthy fruits and vegetables. So again, even though they do provide nutrients, they're really not providing enough nutrients that the birds need uh, during their migrations. So the next species is privet. Uh, and this um, species is something that was uh, originally brought uh, over for landscaping purposes in uh, 1860. And as many of us know, it is still very commonly used in uh, hedges and other landscaping in uh, people's homes and gardens today. Uh, but when this happens, when we landscape with these invasive plants, uh, escapees into our natural areas is generally inevitable. It's probably going to happen uh, either from birds consuming the seeds and then pooping them out elsewhere, or sometimes these, um, 
species can be windborne and they can spread that way. So again, anytime we're, we're landscaping with invasive plants, even though they might not be an issue in someone's front yard, they can escape into our natural areas and that is where they become problematic. Uh, uh, and so privets are known to form dense thickets that will reduce light and moisture availability for native shrubs and wildflowers. And, be, and when they do this, that will ultimately decrease the plant diversity that is in uh, a natural space, which ultimately impacts the animals that depend on native plants for food and shelter. So again, um, you know, when, when we're having these invasive plants go into uh, our natural spaces, the wildlife are certainly being impacted uh, negatively. And we would we really hope to have more native plants than we do uh, invasive species. So these two um, species, uh, even though they look similar, are just a little bit different. Uh, on the left-hand side is Japanese barberry, and on the right-hand side is European barberry. And if you'll take a, just a quick look at the leaves, we can see that the leaves of Japanese barberry are, um, are fairly smooth on the edges, um, and the, the leaves on the European barberry have little serrations on them. So there may be, I'm not, I don't claim to be uh, an identification expert of different plant species, but I know that that is one of the main differences uh, between these two uh, species of barberry. So again, something to be aware of. Uh, so Japanese barberry, just like privet, is still something that a lot of people are utilizing in their landscaping. And it is, it is very beautiful. Again, looking at this picture here on the left-hand side, it's it's a very um, complementary plant, or so it seems, to include in your landscaping. But the problem is, again, when it's spread into these natural areas from your landscaping, that's where it becomes a problem. And so, um, you know, it is still sold commercially, um, and, and unfortunately, that's still a battle that's being fought, but that's the way it is, at least for now. Uh, and so spread into natural areas from these uh, landscape areas is generally inevitable. So do your homework, um, select only native or uh, exotic non-invasive species uh, when, you're, when you're landscaping your property. Also some, something that's been in the news uh, of late um, is the fact that barberry is a big tick magnet. And so that's been a big deterrent for a lot of people, which is, which is ultimately a good thing as far as uh, not wanting to plant this species uh, at your home. And so uh, the density of ticks with the uh, causal agent of Lyme disease, which is Borrelia burgdorferi, um, they there is just a higher density uh, of of that uh, in forests where there is a higher percentage of barberry. And so we can see in the um, the image here on the bottom right hand corner that a forest that's infested uh, with barberry has uh, 120 ticks per acre compared to a forest without barberry where there's only about 10 ticks per acre. So that's a huge difference. And if anything, a really great reason to get rid of the barberry so that you can lower the amount of ticks that are there. Okay, the next species I'm sure many of you are familiar with, this is garlic mustard. And garlic mustard, something that maybe some of you uh, don't, uh, are not aware of or don't realize, um, so there is a rare butterfly, uh, the uh, West Virginia white butterfly, uh, and it will um, mistakenly lay its eggs on garlic mustard, which is a species very similar to toothwort, which is its native host plant that it generally would lay its eggs on. But because garlic mustard and toothwort look very similar, it will sometimes confuse the two. And when it has its eggs on garlic mustard, the hatching caterpillars are unable to eat the garlic mustard because they are not evolved to do so and they will die and so essentially this rare butterfly is becoming even more rare because of the uh, high amounts of garlic mustard that we have in our natural areas so again you know when we see uh, places that look like this where you have you know a natural space and the understory is just covered in garlic mustard this is a really sad sight to see. However, it's really important that we map something like this um, so that we can alert others uh, that management needs to occur at this, at this place because something like 
the West Virginia white butterfly is certainly being impacted. Okay, our next species is Japanese stiltgrass. And this is uh, a species that um, is relatively unpalatable unpal to um, a lot of our wildlife. And so because of that, it actually probably encourages heavier deer browsing on the surrounding native plant populations, which, which is fine, but to the point that a lot of the native plants are disappearing um, and the stiltgrass is remaining due to the wildlife consuming only the natives is certainly problematic. Um, it also poses a threat to native understory vegetation, uh, again, because it will outcompete, as you can see here in some of these pictures, and it's commonly found in disturbed settings, such as trail edges. So whenever you're out hiking uh, or just enjoying the outside and you're walking on a trail, make sure that afterwards you do clean your shoes, clean off any mud or seeds uh, that may have attached themselves to your, your um your shoes or your, your pants, because we want to make sure that we're not transporting uh, a species like this to other places where it might not be. Okay, our next species is calorie pear. And this species, just like some of the other ones we've talked about um, that a lot of people like to plant, uh, calorie pear has been popularized as an ornamental tree. But again, when we plant it in uh, these, these urban spaces or our yards and gardens, uh, escape into natural settings is generally inevitable where it will then outcompete our native species and that's where it causes problems. And so, um, you know, anytime you have an alien plant species in a natural area, uh, it is not evolved. The, the native species that live here uh, are not evolved to, to utilize that plant as a food source. Uh, it is, so it's of no benefit or nourishment to them. And so in locations where native plants are sparse, uh, native insects are also going to be sparse, and in turn, that really impacts our wildlife. So when we have spaces like this picture here on the right-hand side, uh, full of calorie pears and probably not a lot of other things, our wildlife cannot use that as nourishment for them. And so that is a big problem. Okay, the next species is Tree of Heaven. And this species is something that has recently gained more attention due to um, the spotted lanternfly, which is a problematic pest in eastern Pennsylvania, uh, southeastern Pennsylvania to be specific. And thankfully, as far as we know, has not yet been found in western Pennsylvania. Um, so if you do happen to, just to go off on a, a little sidetrack, if you do happen to see spotted lanternfly, um, you know, anywhere in western Pennsylvania, or even if you're in the east, in eastern Pennsylvania, um, please report your findings to the Department of Agriculture because this is a, a very big problematic species. Um, but getting back on the tree of heaven, uh, this is a species that will give off allelopathic uh, chemicals and essentially uh, inhibit the germination and growth of other plants that might want to be growing nearby. Uh, and so, because it has this ability it gives Tree of Heaven a competitive advantage over native species. And so anytime you have a grove of Tree of Heaven, uh, you probably don't have a lot of other um, diverse species growing nearby because of those aleopathic compounds. Uh, and just as a quick tidbit, the scientific name Alanthus, um, uh, also known as Sky Tree, and the common name Tree of Heaven uh, refer to this tree's ability to grow towards the sky very quickly. Uh, so that's where it gets its name, and again, because it grows so quickly, just like so many other invasive species, it does. Uh, it is able to outcompete our natives because it will grow a little bit quicker than than the natives do. Okay, the next species we'll talk about is purple loosestrife, and this is a species that uh, really likes uh, wetland areas, and so it will establish itself there. Uh, and spread, and then ultimately outcompete uh, important native grasses and other flowering plants that would, uh, in, other, in any other time, provide high quality food and habitat sources for our wildlife. So, when you have an, an area that's overwhelmed with purple loosestrife, you're certainly uh, negatively impacting the ecosystem there and the wildlife that would live there. Uh, also, because of a long flowering season, purple loosestrife. 
um, is able to produce an estimated two to three million seeds per year from its 30 to 50 flowering stems. So certainly it has the ability to, to spread um, based on its reproduction rate. Uh, and so something just to keep in mind that this one, as well as many other invasive species, uh, do spread and reproduce um, very rapidly uh, and in high quantities. Uh, purple loosestrife is a uh, Pennsylvania noxious weed, but don't let it fool you. Even though it is a very beautiful plant, uh, again, as we mentioned, it is um, able to spread to these important wetland habitats, which in turn is very harmful to our native plants and, and wildlife. So please make sure to report your findings. Also, I do want to touch on some uh, species that are a little bit more rare or uncommon in Pennsylvania. So you might not see them, or you might. So again, just uh, keep your eyes peeled for some of these. So this species is kudzu. And kudzu, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, even though we don't have uh, a lot of it in Pennsylvania, it's more of a southern plant. Uh, we do have some in Pennsylvania, though. Uh, it can grow at a rate of one foot per day. Uh, and its weight has been known to fell trees and collapse buildings. So again, this is one um, that just grows very, very quickly uh, and has the ability to take over entire landscapes. So if you see this, definitely want to make sure to report this species. Again, this is another uh, Pennsylvania noxious weed. OK, the next species is hardy kiwi vine. And we've touched on this one already, but we'll go a little bit more in depth on this one. So hardy kiwi vine uh, is popular in home garden, and because of that, it is available even now at many landscaping and nursery dealers as well as online. However, I would certainly discourage you from planting this plant at your home because just like so many other species, it can spread and invade into our natural spaces. So here on the right-hand side, this is a picture that, is, that was taken in New England. Um, and it can just completely take over an entire landscape. Uh, it forms these dense mats of intertwining vines uh, that can severely overwhelm other vegetation, including trees. So again, it might not look like a problem in your yard or garden, but when it transfers over into our natural spaces and there is no control, then this is exactly what can happen. And this is not a good thing to have happen at all, certainly. Okay, this species is fairly new to Pennsylvania as of the last few years. This is wavy leaf basket grass. So wavy leaf basket grass can completely cover a forest floor. And this is problematic um, because it will compete against our native forest species that are trying to regenerate. So for example, here's a picture um, of some young oak saplings that are trying to grow um, but if you have a habitat where all you have in the understory is wavy leaf basket grass, you're probably not going to have a lot of other things growing there. And so essentially, if wavy leaf basket grass is in an area um, and allow it to spread, you're going to have much regeneration of native heart. Entire forest ecosystems will be negatively impacted. So again, this one is fairly new to Pennsylvania. We've had it for a few years, and it's fairly limited in scope. But again, we do want to make sure that we're watching for this species. OK, this one is Japanese angelica tree. And uh, where, where it's been observed at, Japanese angelica tree uh, acts much more aggressively than its native uh, Aurelia spinosa, which is also known as devil's walking stick. Um, and because of that, it replaces native vegetation and reduces overall biodiversity. Uh, so we can see here, I have pictures on the left of um, the invasive uh, Aurelia alata, the Japanese angelica tree, and the native counterpart, which looks very similar, um, which is devil's walking stick. So again, if you're out and you see something that looks like this, you probably want to just take a closer look and make sure that you know uh, which one you're looking at. Um, and so uh, some records of uh, the North American native uh, devil's walking stick that were found previously in Maryland and Delaware are now thought to have actually been Japanese angelica tree. 
So I would encourage you, we, we went through a bunch of different species, uh, be on the lookout for these and also, um, you know, any other species that you might find in your natural areas. And I know we certainly didn't cover all of them because that would have taken uh, a much longer time for a, another webinar. Um, but just kind of brush up on the species that are um, in your area and be on the lookout for them when you're out in your natural spaces. And with that, uh, I will take any questions that anyone has. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, so again, if anyone has any questions, um, please uh, go ahead and, and ask away. Hi, can you hear me, Amy? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Hi, um, this is Keely. So I was just wondering if um, there are any species on that list that you're really not looking for records for beyond like cultivated species that are not in natural areas. So, for example, I saw European starling. So would I mean, if it's in the app, should we report it or should we be are there a few species that you really don't need reports of? I would say if it's available and it's in our track list to go ahead and report it if you're finding it because any and all information that we can gather is probably going to be useful to someone uh, somewhere. Um, so again, you know, I would say if you're finding European starling or really any invasive species that you know that is invasive, go ahead and, and mark that if you're seeing it. Thank you. Sure. Um, I believe there was a question about Oriental bittersweet. Um, so that was, uh, again, that is a, another big uh, problematic species in our natural spaces. And just given uh, the time for today's webinar, uh, it wasn't included, but not because it's not a problem. Uh, so if you're seeing Oriental bittersweet uh, in your natural areas, again, please make sure to, um, to map and record where you're seeing it. There, there is just so many species uh, today that, that really are problematic and it's just, it's hard to, to hit on all of them during an hour webinar. So yes, certainly if you're seeing Oriental Bittersweet, please do, uh, do record that. Is there any other questions? We still have a few more uh, minutes of time left. Okay, so I have to open up my chat box, make sure that I'm getting all the questions here. So um, there was a question, if we misidentify or, for example, say bush honeysuckle and can narrow down the species, are we told? Um, yeah, so uh, the at least for specifically for, for honeysuckle, one of the options that is available in the track list is to select um, the generic version. So Lanicera spa would be for you know, any invasive honeysuckle, whether you might know the identification or not. Um, and that's true for privet as well. We have ligustrum species that you can choose from if you're not sure. Um, but if you're taking good photos along with your observations, um, what we would do then is if we can, if that's, you know, if you do mark it as bush honeysuckle, Lanicera spa, and we would go in and say, I can confirm that this is actually Japanese honeysuckle, then we would go in and just change the, um, the label of what you're calling it because we could actually identify what it is. Um, and I would, I would try my best to make sure to let you know that we were actually able to further identify the identification for that species. So uh, in answer to your question, yes. And then also um, we had a question about if the webinar is being recorded. Um, yes, the webinar was recorded. And um, after everything is wrapped up today, um, I will be um, sending a link out to um, all IMAP Invasives registered users. So for anyone who was not able to tune in today, you will have an opportunity um, to listen in um, at a later time. So yes, it is being recorded. Great question. Any other questions? Tree of Heaven. 
Is, is yes, what about same, Tree of Heaven? Yeah, is that the same species as the one that's called the Chinese Tree of Heaven? They, they're fairly large. Um, I don't know if I personally have heard of Chinese Tree of Heaven. I, I always, um, I hesitate with common names because there's so many, you know, various common names out there. So I would actually want to know the scientific name just to double check if they are the same thing or not. So I'm not entirely sure about that one. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. Yeah, I, I asked because I know of a, a friend who lives in the Highland Park area in Pittsburgh and has um, always lived there for maybe 15 years and said that in his backyard is this huge uh, species that we call Chinese Tree of Heaven. And um, it's, it, within the last 15 years, I've grown shoots underneath that created other ones, like, uh, I guess, the rhizomes. That okay. Created. Interesting. And I wasn't sure whether that would have been something that's, you know, critical. Yeah, I mean, I would say just for um, purposes of figuring that out, go ahead and, and record it. Go out and take a, a good picture or a few pictures of it, submit it, um, and then that way we'll be able to review um, you know what what it might actually be, and um, and we can go from there. Thank you. Um, so there's another question as far as the app goes. Is there a way to access other reports from the app, or is that only available in the desktop version? Great question. Um, so yeah, the app is limited in ability or scope as far as the other things you can do with it. So the app is only able to capture. Um, your, the data, like the observation data that you're seeing out in the fields. You can't actually utilize the app to review your record once you've submitted it or review um, other data that's in the database. You'd have to log on either to the desktop version um, or also now that we have the new version of IMAP, um, you can actually access the, the database itself from your mobile device. Now just keep in mind, that doing that is different than the app itself. The app is something that you can collect data with without an internet connection. And if you're using the database while in the field, you would need an internet, an internet connection uh, for that. Um, so as, if you're just using the app, it's only able to capture that observation data um, and that's, that's all it can do. Great questions. Is there is there any other questions? We still do have a few more minutes left. Uh, is this similar to the iNaturalist? Um, I, uh, yeah, so um, uh, iNaturalist is uh, is similar. Um, iNaturalist will, will track uh, any species, um, any living thing, essentially. Uh, so native species, invasive species, um, you know, plants, animals, I think they track maybe even diseases. I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that, but so they do have similar capabilities, whereas um, IMAP invasives is only tracking uh, species that we know to be invasive um, and here in Pennsylvania. And again, uh, IMAP invasives is a network. And so we have other states and provinces that are also part of the network. So for example, nearby we have New York. So if you're traveling uh, in New York and you're finding species that you want to record, uh, you can do that. Um, and actually I believe the way the new platform is set up, if you're in any state, whether or not they are actually participating uh, in, the, um, in the network, in the IMAP basis network, you can record um, species that you're finding. But for the places that don't have an active administrator, those records will not be confirmed, at least not very quickly. Um, so that's the main difference. But essentially, you can record data um, anywhere you are. Any other questions before we wrap up? OK. All right, well, I guess we'll wrap things up. Um, again, this was a recorded webinar, so I'll be sending out a link, uh, hopefully later today or tomorrow, to anyone that has a registered user account, and of course, to all of you as well, so you can share it out with your um, colleagues. And uh, if you do have any follow-up questions, 
Um, my contact information is here. You can always feel free to reach out to me. And there are a few other webinars coming up uh, this year, one at the end of June and one in July. So if you go to the paimapinvasives.org website uh, and check out the events tab, you can find more information uh, and register for those upcoming webinars as well. So thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.